All right, the title of the sermon this morning is 12 Pillars of the Christian Life. 12 Pillars of the Christian Life. I've just been, I was, I was thinking on this topic, I've talked about it with a couple of the guys here, <clears throat> to try and think, <clears throat> we were reflecting on, you know, Islam have, has its five pillars. Uh, you know what those are. Um, and we're, I was wondering, you know, if you were to name the pillars of the Christian life. I don't know if pillars is the right term. I mean, obviously Islam uses that term. But if you can think of a better word, I mean, I was trying to think of a better word of what to call these. It's like 12 areas of the Christian life, like 12 pillars of what we do as Christians. Um, so I want to talk about these today because, you know, it's a new year and I think it's good to reflect on, you know, how your Christian life is doing. And if you know the different areas of the Christian life, you can look at your own Christian life and see, you know, am I, what am I doing or what am I accomplishing in each of these areas? So we want to go over the 12 today. <clears throat> so the reason why we're reading Matthew 5, because there's a passage in there, it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So these 12 pillars are kind of like the areas of good works that you do in the Christian life. So we're going to talk mainly today and brush on each of the 12 quickly and looking more at what they are. You know, we're not really going to address, you know, when you start doing these. You know, when you start doing them is after salvation. So we're not, so one of the pillars is not going to be salvation because salvation is how you get saved and the understanding around salvation. And once you are saved as a Christian, how should you live your Christian life? What are the things you should be doing? Um, we're also not going to talk about purpose and attitude, right? So that's the why and the how. So purpose, obviously, we do it to glorify God. And the attitude in which we do it is we do it you know, out of love and we do it out of gratitude, not out of you know, fear necessarily and things like that. Those are the highest attitudes that we should have. We're just going to be talking about the what. So there's 12 today, and uh, let's talk about them each one at a time. And what I want you to think about this morning, and why I thought it was a good sermon for New Year's Day, like I said, it's a good time to reflect on how your spiritual life is doing. And as we touch on each of these pillars, you ask yourself the question, you know, how am I doing in this area of my Christian life? All right, so the first one we're going to talk about is the Bible. The Bible. You know, the Bible obviously is the foundation, it's the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So I've tried to put these in a logical order, but they're not necessarily in order or in order of importance, but just something that I thought was logical to teach through this morning. So we'll start with the Bible, Joshua 1.8. This book of the law <coughs> shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. This is a great verse about the Bible, because it says here that the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. See, it says not depart out of your house, right? Like it's not just having a Bible on the shelf, and it just it doesn't depart out of your house. Or out of your, it's in your mouth. Why? Because you're talking about it. You know what it says. Right? That's why it doesn't depart out of your mouth. And you meditate therein. What is meditate? It's not like these today where you're just emptying your mind. You're actually thinking on what God's word. That's why it's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Right? Meditate therein day and night. That thou may it's not, not meditate therein once a week. Meditate therein once a month. Right? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Why? For the purpose of helping you to keep God's word. And that's why the verse for our kids Bible club, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then shalt have good success. Matthew 22, 29. See, if you don't know your Bible well, you will fall into error. Like Jesus says, Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And you will err in your Christian life if you do not know the scriptures, which are the power of God, right? For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. 
but it's touching the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read? So why? He's correcting people here. They have wrong doctrine. And he's saying to them, have you not read? See, if you read the Bible, you know the scriptures, you won't err. Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So look, when we talk about the Bible in your Christian life, it is more than just reading a verse or a small passage now and then. You know, there are different aspects to the Bible in the Christian life. One is, you know, you've know, got to make sure you're reading the Bible. You know, read through the Bible. Read the whole Bible. You know, don't just do the daily devotional that just gives you a couple of passages. When I say reading the Bible, I mean like serious reading, like where you're reading chapters of it. You're reading through it. You, you know the Bible as a whole, as opposed to just portions of it. You know, yes, it's a, it's a longer book than the Quran. You know, the Quran's a very short book. You know, other books are very short. The Bible's a longer book, but it doesn't change. So you can read through it. It's not going to change next year. There's no different editions of the Bible. There's one. We have the King James Bible. It's done. So, reading your Bible. But not just reading it. You know, you want to be studying your Bible too. So there's a difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible. Studying is to make sure you understand it well. You might be comparing scriptures. And then lastly, like you have your word, the Word of God in your heart, memorizing God's Word. You know, that's why it's important. That's why we encourage you to try and memorize the scriptures that we're encouraging the kids to memorize. These scriptures will help you. You know, especially if you memorize the first 10. The first 10 verses are the plan of salvation verses. right? So that you know the plan of salvation. You memorize them. You will know them better. You will be able to explain them better as well. All right? Second pillar. Godliness. Godliness. Now, this pillar is a very broad pillar, isn't it? And I think, like, you know, you know under godliness, there is a multitude of different things that you can preach on, all different aspects of godliness and things like that. And I've listed a few here, you know, striving for perfection. But basically, what is godliness, right? Godliness is a desire to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Striving for perfection. Second Peter 1, we see the steps here. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Right, so if Christ has died and buried and rose again, saying, hey, we should walk as a new creature, right? Like Christ rose again from the dead. So godliness is a huge category, right? But it's about becoming more like Jesus Christ, living a godly Christian life. What does that mean? That we, you know, we love God. We love our neighbor as ourselves. And there's many aspects to this. Right? But I think we can all be just categorized as trying to live more godly. You know, growing in faithfulness. Repenting of sin. Right? Turning from our sin and trying to live a more pure, godly life. Hard work. You know, being a good example. Being diligent in the things that we do. Being a virtuous person. Right? Cleanliness right? in body and spirit. Purity, you know, forsaking worldliness. You, know, you, love, you love the Father that's not in you. You love the world. Selflessness, sacrifice. You know, what about conflict resolution? Building strong relationships with people. What about in your appearance? Godly appearance. In your speech and in how you communicate. Right? So there's a lot of areas of godliness and I mean every one of those things I just mentioned could be a sermon in and of themselves. Each of these pillars could be a sermon. I'm trying to give you an overview here of like the Christian life. Right? So we have godliness, right? And if I was to sum it up in a few words, it's just trying to be more like Jesus Christ. So that's an aspect of the Christian life. How are you doing there in your 
godliness. Number three is church. Church is an obvious one. We're in church right now. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You can see that verse we know is about church. We use that for church a lot. But you see how it's, it's more than just church attendance, isn't it? Church in the Christian life is more than just attendance. It's more than just rocking up on a Sunday, hopefully being consistent, hopefully being on time, you know, those sorts of things, and coming and learning and listening to a sermon. Church is so much more than that. And you see more than that in this verse. You know, considering one another, right? It's about the community, provoking unto love and to good works, being part of that community and encouraging and provoking one another, right? So you see, how do you prov- think about how would you provoke somebody to do good works? Well, you would try and encourage them. You'd know yourself what to do. You'd try and be an example to inspire others to try and live a godly life. This is what church is meant to be about. It's not just about ticking a box on your spiritual checklist and saying, yeah, I went to church today. Yeah, I went to church this week. That's not the extent of this pillar, right? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's what most people think about with church. It's a matter of some is, but look, but exhorting one another. So much the more as you see the day approaching. So there are different aspects to church, right? Of course, there is the attendance where you come and you learn, but it's also about the community, being part of the people here and the accountability that being part of that community brings. And that's a real thing, guys, you know, being part of a community and the accountability so that you don't go and make silly decisions in your life because you have to think, gosh, I wonder what people at church are going to think. That's, that's a good thing, right, to keep you accountable in your life. But also the service, right, what ministries that you do for God is something that you do at church as well. All right, number four. Number four is baptism, right, baptism. And whether people are baptized. Baptism is part of the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So we see here <clears throat> in Acts 8, somebody being baptized, Philip and the eunuch. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet? This, of himself or of some other man? Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He preaches him the gospel. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, What's stopping me from being baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So baptism, right? Baptism means you are baptized under the water by immersion after salvation. That's what believers baptism in. That's what means you're baptized, right? So this pillar is about one being baptized yourself, right? So if you're you're not baptized, you know, well, we got to get you baptized, right? And baptism happens after salvation. So you say like, you know, some people say like, oh yeah, well I was baptized in the Catholic Church as a child. Well, you were sprinkled prior to salvation. That's not salvation. You were baptized into the Orthodox Church. Or you say, I was baptized at a Pentecostal church, but I wasn't saved back then. But, you know, now I'm baptized. Now that I'm saved, I've already been baptized. No. You know, baptism, like I said, it is believer's baptism. You baptize after you were saved by immersion. And we want to encourage other people to be baptized too, right? So we know people that aren't baptized. You know, you getting baptized, we'll encourage them to get baptized. And we want to make sure everyone that is a believer gets baptized. We want to make sure that you take that step of obedience. All right, number five is communion. Communion. So we do that in this church once uh, a month, on the second Sunday of the month. But, you know, you've got to be at church to be part of it communion and you know communion i think is an important thing and it's you know we everyone has all these traditions in their life 
right? I mean, we have the tradition, different traditions that we do, you know, birthdays, anniversaries, and Christmas, and Easter, and people, all the different practices that they do. But there's one thing, there's one tradition that Jesus has given us, right? And it's communion. And that's why, you know, this, this is one I, I cherish because, you know, it's one that is actually given of the Lord to say, hey, this is something that we do and it is a purposeful act of remembrance, right? It's, like, it's not something we do just to feel spiritual. It's, it's, it's something that has been implemented in the Christian life so that we do something purposeful as an act of remembrance. You know, countries do all sorts of things. So, you know, we have Anzac Day, and we have, you know, the Queen's birthday. We want to do all these other things that we remember. But, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, especially Anzac Day, I'm not saying that these things are not important. But what's more important is the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So that's why it's, it's like a, you know, so we believe it's a practice that Jesus Christ did for his disciples. He also delivered it unto Paul, who then continued that practice, and he was telling the Corinthian church about it. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do his off as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So this is why I think it's a great practice, because you know, not only reminds us and makes us periodically think about what Jesus Christ did for us, but it also is a testimony to others to remember, you know, hey, this is what Jesus Christ did for us. It's the one practice that Christ gave us to continue. You know, besides baptism, but baptism is not something you continually do. It's just something that you do once, once you're saved. All right, number six. Number six is prayer. Number six is prayer. Now, prayer is more than just saying a prayer before eating. Sometimes in Christian families, it's like nominal Christian families, they think, yeah, we pray, and all they do is say a couple of words before they eat. But prayer is also more than just repeating a set form of words. You know, you think about the Orthodox and the Catholic Church, they might give you a prayer book, and people will say when they pray, they just look in the book and they just repeat a few phrases in these books. Oh, it's more than that, isn't it? Right? 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we can see here that we have, you know, part of prayer is supplication and thanksgiving. Right? So what is prayer, if you think about it? Prayer is not just talking to God, you know, technically. You know, prayer, when you pray for something, it's when you ask for something. So supplication, you know, I think is... Supplication is like asking God to supply certain things, you know, to supply things for other people. But then you also have prayers of thanksgiving as well, where you just saying thanks to God and praising Him, things that He does. We also have prayers of like confession, aren't we? When we confess our sins to God, First John one nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, so there is confession in the Christian life, and I would categorize that under something that we do when we pray, but it's not confession like you think about in work salvation denominations, right, where you're confessing to try and stay saved and to get rid of, cleanse your sin and, and keep you pure. These, this confession in the Christian life is you're already saved and you are just maintaining a good relationship with your Heavenly Father. Right? So it's not to obtain grace for salvation, but grace in terms of, you know, grace from your Heavenly Father and keeping that good relationship with Him. Right? So not only do we confess to God, but James 5, 16 tells us here, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So you can see here that Prayer is more than just saying a few words, praying before you eat. You know, it's actually considering one another, like we saw in Hebrews 10, right? Praying for one another. That's why it's, you know, we started doing the prayer list. You know, take one, pray for one another, add to it. 
you know, so we don't print it out every week, but you know, if you know something to pray for, add to that prayer list, and then you can pray for it in your times of prayer. Right? So pray one for another. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All right, number seven, seventh pillar of the Christian life, fasting, fasting. We see here fasting is not just an Old Testament practice, right? Acts 14, we see in the New Testament here, after the resurrection, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation, we must through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting. So you see, it's still a practice that they continued in the New Testament. And you always see fasting along with prayer. Right? It's not just fasting for the sake of fasting. Like, fa wh Why do they fast? Right? It's not something that's just done for health reasons. You know, intermittent fasting is just like this new tr trend, right? And you know, you intermittent fast for health reasons, that's not the fasting that the Bible's talking about, right? Like if you're doing fasting for health reasons, then that's fine, right? If it's healthy, you believe it's healthy as well, that's fine. But that's not what fasting is in the Bible. What is the purpose of fasting in the New Testament? Fasting is obviously abstaining from pleasures and abstaining from food, you know, in the main instance, food, right? But why do you fast? You fast because you are trying to show God the earnestness of your prayers. Right? You're praying for something. You're praying to something, God. Do you really mean it? Do you really want what you're praying for? Well, when you fast, you are showing God how earnest you are in the things you are asking Him for. And that's why when they prayed for very serious things, whether they would be praying for one another, and here they're, they're ordaining elders in this church and committing them unto this ministry. And then they're, you know, this is a, in the days where they can't just travel here and there. They're not contacting each other on the phone and things like that, video chat. So they are really just commending them and trusting that God will be with them. It's a serious time here. And they, and they prayed over them with fasting. So you can see here that fasting, yes, is about abstaining from food. Some people even do like, you know, liquid fasts and things like that. But it's also, I think, Fasting is about abstaining from pleasures as well, just the pleasures of this life. Because we see here in 1 Corinthians 7, it's about the obligations that husband and wife have to one another. But look at what it says here in verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves, look, to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So you see here that even though fasting is about abstaining from food and denying those physical sustenance of your body, it also is in line with fasting, that you don't fast and still like just indulge in other pleasures, right, that are not food, right? The idea is here that you are abstaining and you are afflicting your body to show God how earnestly you want him to answer your prayers, right? So that's what fasting is about. That's number seven. Number eight. Number eight, eighth pillar in the Christian life of this sermon, is singing. Singing. See, singing is a pillar in the Christian life. You know, like, like all these pillars, and the reason why I've sort of separated them up into separate pillars is because they don't, they don't substitute one for another. Right? Like in some churches, they think, oh, you know, well, I'm part of the choir, I'm singing, so I don't have to do some other thing, in the, some other pillar in the Christian life, like evangelism, which we're going to talk about later. And likewise, sometimes the soul winners have the opposite mindset. Well, I preach the gospel, that's why I'm serving God. I don't need to be a singer, right? But no, singing is a pillar of the Christian life. Think about the largest book in the Bible, the book of Psalms, right? It's all about songs. Singing is a pillar in the Christian life, and every Christian should desire to want to sing. Why? Because God wants you to sing. God wants to hear your voice. And the more you sing, the better you're going to get at it. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And just like with other things, hey, look, singing in the Christian life is more than just 
the congregational singing at church. You say, yes, I sing, you know. You, know, you, can have, you don't want to have this mindset in your Christian life that you just try and do the bare minimum. You, know, you say, yeah, okay, I sung a song at church that week, I'm singing in my Christian life. You know, that's, you know, are you technically singing in your Christian life? Yeah, but do you have the right attitude? You know, is the attitude of, you know, am I, am I getting better at singing? Am I, doing, you know, am, I, am I becoming more of a singing Christian? So it's more than just congregational singing at church. You know, it makes you, it makes you obviously you need to be at church to participate in that. But it's about praising the Lord in your heart every day. And that's why, you know, it's part of it is the music that you listen to. Because if you're listening to worldly music, what do you think you're going to be humming to yourself and singing throughout the day? And this is why it's so important that you change your playlist, that you listen to Christian music, right? It's not just about feeling spiritual. It's about listening to things that praise God, that remind you of God's goodness, that remind you of God's truth, so that you, during the day, when you find yourself humming something, that you are humming things that remind you of things of God. Praise God. Right? So singing. Singing is a pillar in the Christian life. Number nine. Ninth pillar in the Christian life is giving. Giving is a pillar in the Christian life. 1 Corinthians 16. Why do we give every week? Right? So I don't think it's, it's not tithing, it's giving. Right? Because tithing is giving, but tithing is a, saying it's a certain percentage. Right? And also, you know, we were talking about this over lunch once, tithing technically is primary production, right? So, so it's a primary production in a government, 10% of primary production, and all the secondary production it wouldn't have to tithe, right? That's why it's the tithe of the land, it's the tithe of the herd, things like that, because God is taking 10% of the increase of the land, not 10% of everyone's labor, right? That's where offerings and sacrifice come in, and these were all voluntary, but the tithe was the Lord's. And why? Because the tithe was given to the Levitical the, the, the Levites that did not have land and they weren't responsible for keeping sheep and keeping cattle and growing crop, right? So the tenth of that increase of everyone else's land was given to the Levites and they had a way of dividing it up as well. First Corinthians 16. Why do we give weekly? Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So you can see there that in the New Testament, the practice there was to lay by in store as God hath prospered you every week, and then this is why a collection is taken every week, to fund the ministry of God. Back then, it was the temple, now it is the church. Deuteronomy 14. So before I go into this verse, I want to say a couple, a couple of things. So one is, you know, giving lab, your labor, so when you volunteer for an organization, that is a form of giving, right? But labor is not a substitute for monetary and material giving. And why would I say that? It's because if you think about it, right, there is, why, why do we need to give? Because giving is supporting those that are doing spiritual work that does not produce commercial revenue, right? So just like the Levites in the temple, right? When they did the sacrifices and everything, they didn't charge people to come to the temple, right? They didn't charge for their services. So God didn't want it to be a commercial revenue stream, right? The way it works is people give of the, what they have prospered to fund those that are doing that work. But think about this, if everyone only contributed labor, right, then what, what do the Levites live on in the Old Testament? If everyone said, oh, you know, I'm just going to help sweep the temple every now and then, I'm just going to, you know, help you out, you know, carry the cows in, you know, and that's my labor. So then what do the Levites go home with? Right, what do they have? So that's why God is saying, hey, you have the tithe, it's a material thing that is given to the Levites because they aren't doing a job that is paying money, and that's how they make their money. So look at the tithe here in Deuteronomy 14, 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, thy wine, of thine oil, thy firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks. And thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So you can see this tithe, and I'm not saying that the New Testament is a tithe necessarily, but obviously we can see how the tithe operates, 
to see material giving in the New Testament, right? So you see how these are things, right? It's not just them volunteering to help at the temple. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, that's these are material possessions, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money and bind up the money in thine hand and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen and for sheep and for wine or for strong drink or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God and thou shalt rejoice thou and thine household. Right, so you can see there that People also benefited from that. Just like when you give to church, you also benefit from it, right? You here, you have a church to attend and things like that. But look what it says here in verse 27. This is what I want you guys to understand here. And it's not just in this church, but just everywhere. Because some people just have this mindset of just like, you know, it's the same happening in political parties as well. It's same happening in any charitable cause. People just expect the workers in that organization to just do everything for free. Right? And what I want you to understand here is like in the Levitical priesthood, right? they did it for free, but how were they funded? They were funded by the tithes and offerings of the people. Right? That's why they were able to do it for free. And it says here, here, and this is why I think God puts this here, right? that this tithe was meant to go towards the Levites, and it says here, and the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. So he's reminding them, remember, don't forget, right, to give your tithes and your offerings, right, because the Levite did not have any land, right, to go and produce these crops and things like that. And, you know, it's, a, it's an unfortunate stereotype, you know, even, I think even the Babylon Bee, like, <laughs> did, a, did a stereotype about it, where, like, you know, um, it was like the pastor's car is this like run down Corolla and then the congregation got upset at him because he just had to upgrade his car or something like that. And it's just like this stereotype that like, you know, pastors live like this very frugal life. But it's an unfortunate thing, right? Yes, there are people that take advantage, right? I'm not saying that there aren't people that take advantage out there, but the stereotype, unfortunately, is there are a lot of pastors out there that struggle, right? And shouldn't be like that in our church. And the only reason why it's like that is because people forsake the Levi, right? They don't think about why they should be giving. So giving is a pillar in the Christian life. Number 10, soul winning. Soul winning this is one we hark on a lot, right? Soul winning is a pillar of the Christian life. This is the Great Commission. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? So we don't, we want to make sure the Great Commission doesn't become the Great Omission. Right? We don't want to cease preaching the gospel. Acts 5.42 Daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So I won't go too much into soul because you guys know how I feel about soul winning. But soul winning is more than just answering people that ask you if you're a Christian, right? We need to be proactive in our soul winning. We need to understand the plan of salvation so we can explain the plan of salvation to people when they ask us, you know? You know, we want to think about your testimony as well, right? How you live and how you behave, how you talk, that's going to affect whether people you know, take you seriously. And more than just being able to explain the plan of salvation is an area of apologetics, right? You want to be ready to defend the faith, explain the faith. So this is all encompassed in soul winning, right? So how, how are we going to persuade people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ when they have an objection and you don't know how to answer it? You know, this is why the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So you see, you have to have reasonable answers. Yes, it might be because the Bible says it, but it also might be other things as well. You know, so it's good to, you need to understand so that you can effectively do this pillar in your Christian life, and that's win souls. All right? Number 11. Number 11, I was trying to think of a word for this one. I had it listed as charity before, but 
just thought that wasn't the best word because when people think of charity, they think of um, just giving money to charitable causes, but that's just one aspect of this. So I've called this pillar society, right? And the reason why I have, I have it as a different pillar because I believe for Christians, you know, it, just serving in church and being part of this community is not enough, right? It's not enough just for us to be inward focused and think about just our brothers and sisters in Christ and just the community and just think, oh, this is how I'm helping. Yeah, do we help society by serving at church? Yes. But I think there is more to what is expected of us as Christians than just being inward focused and thinking only about our own, our own small community. Matthew 5.13, this is where we started the sermon. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost its savour, his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden underfoot of men. So salt being like this flavour, I think of salt as like having this truth in you, right? But see, the salt doesn't just have this flavour, right, and then stay to itself. It's wherewith shall it be salted, right? The idea of salt is it's meant to give flavour to other things. But the point of verse 13 is saying, if the salt doesn't have any flavour, when you sprinkle it around the place, like Christians all around the earth, it's not going to do any good. But the idea is that Christians are around the earth, sprinkled all over, doing good, right? And they're doing good with the savour that they have. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is why, this is why I'm, you know, against this idea of just like living off the grid and just like departing from society, right? Yeah, I get it if you're on the run. You know, if you're on the run and you're trying to hide from, you know, heavy persecution, you have no choice but to be off the grid because you'll be killed otherwise, right? That's one thing. But just living off the grid because you're just sick of society, right? It's not the Christian way to live. Why? Because society, I believe, is one of the pillars of the Christian life where you are in this world as salt and light to impact the society that you live in. How, you know, going and living off grid is like your light putting it under a bushel. If nobody knows you exist, what impact are you going to have on society, right? Does this look like the life lived off the grid, anonymous, nobody knows who you are? How are you meant to let your light so shine before men that they may see, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven? Right? So this is why Christians need to be active in society. And there are many ways to do that. You know that, you know, you know that I am passionate about politics because I believe politics is simply the way our country is governed and the laws around it. But that's not the only way to participate in society, fulfill, you know, your, you know, what you want to do in this pillar of society. You know, there are many charitable causes that people can participate in, whether you give to charitable causes, volunteer for charitable causes, humanitarian causes, right? So there's that as well. You know, maybe it's not just a cause to, to affect change, just political causes. And then there are humanitarian causes too. But Christians should take part somewhere in this. That's why I have it as a pillar. And, and like I said, the reason why I have these pillars is because I don't believe they substitute one for another. All right? So we, have, we should, in our Christian life, have something in each one of these areas. Galatians 6, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Right? It doesn't say let us do good unto all men but only to those that are of the household of faith, which is some people's mindset. And that's what I'm saying. Just doing good to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ isn't enough, right? What we are expected also to do is impact the society around us. And that's why we do good unto all men, especially, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So we see the priority there, but we don't see that it is exclusive, okay? And the last pillar, last pillar, teaching. Teaching is the last pillar. So I have this one last because everything else is about Christian life. 
And then we need to make sure that we are participating in some way of carrying on that legacy, teaching it to the next generation, right? Being a good example, being a mentor. This is where I would also include parenting, right? Make sure you're a good parent. It's about raising the next generation, teaching the things of God. Just read this passage in Titus 2 because I just thought it had all the elements here. You know, Titus 2, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. See how this is about teaching. This is talking specifically to Titus, but why is he teaching these things that become sound doctrine? That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. So you see how it's setting the example to teach others the right example. The aged men, right? And then the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Why? That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young, we young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So you see there that we want to be teaching all these different types of categories of people the right way to live. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So don't read this passage and just think, oh, this is just for leaders. This is Titus. He's the leader. Yeah, he's, yeah. Leaders are expected to do this, but that doesn't mean you should not also be striving, right, for this. Leaders are meant to try to be living the ideal Christian life. You also should be striving for that. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, for he, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Not answering, again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. Right? So, teaching is the twelfth pillar of the Christian life. And of course, it goes over into parenting as well. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So, I don't know, these are the 12 pillars of the Christian life. Maybe I missed one. What do you guys think? You know, I like, you know, and Ashton knows this about me, I like, to, I like to categorize things. Kind of makes it easy to think about it as a whole. And, you know, once you kind of like can compartmentalize and categorize things, you know, it makes, you, it makes it easier to think about. Right? So Bible, godliness, church, baptism, communion, prayer, fasting, singing, giving, soul winning, society and teaching. You know, I used to think, you know, and maybe I'm thinking about these more because I'm trying to figure out like a fundamental sort of teaching for Christianity. Um, I used to think there was only five. You know, I used to say, okay, it was salvation, five things of teaching, like salvation, the Bible, church, prayer, soul winning and, you know, godliness. But there are actually more aspects to the Christian life. Um, that need to be taught and people need to do. So, on this day, start of the new year, make sure you are doing something in each of these areas. And why have I listed them separate? Because you might say, oh, well, you know, some of them are similar, like prayer and fasting. The reason why I've listed these separate, and I've mentioned it in the sermon, is because... I don't believe these can be substituted for one another, right? You can't say, I'm soul winning, therefore I don't need to read my Bible. Or I'm reading my Bible, therefore I don't need to be singing. Or I'm praying, therefore I don't need to be fasting, right? But within these categories, I think, you know, there is a variety of different things that can be done that could substitute for one another. Like when I talked about society, well, if somebody's part of a humanitarian cause, they might go, well, that's how I'm impacting society. I might not be investing my time in a political cause, right? So there are substitutes, I think, within these categories. But this is why I've listed these as pillars. I believe that as Christians, you should be able to look at these 12 categories and say, what am I doing in each of these categories? And if you are not doing something in one of these categories, then that is an area of growth that you need to go, hey, well, what can I do to make sure that I am living a you know, sort of complete Christian life. And obviously it gets deeper and more than that, but I'm just trying to look at this at a high level. So I don't believe these are substitutes for each other. And 
I thought it'd be a good time to think about this, you know. Today is the start of a new year. So however your spiritual life was in the past, you know, let's look forward and let's strive for better this year. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, your word and thank you for, you know, giving us these different areas in our Christian life that we can focus on and, and think, you know, uh, what is my Christian life complete? Is it full? And I can start working on improving in each of these different areas. But Lord, we don't want to neglect an area of our Christian life. So, Lord, help us. You know, thank you for the new year. Thank you for a reset in our mind and our perspectives. Pray, Lord, that we continue to grow and to flourish in our spiritual life. Help us to be salt and light in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.